Today's video is brought to you by Rocket Money. To try it out for free and unlock more features with premium, head to rocketmoney.com slash Kendall. Hello everyone and welcome back. So happy to have you here with me today to discuss another case. And if you are new, then welcome. So today we are going to be discussing the ongoing, very mysterious disappearance of Lydia or Dia Abrams. And this one again is an ongoing investigation. So we do not have all the information that will eventually, hopefully be coming out. But I am gonna tell you what we do know so far and I am very curious to hear your thoughts on this one because it's pretty wild just all the different pieces that are involved with this all of the potential motives it's one of those cases where there is a lot of money involved and that always makes everything a lot more complicated i am recording this video on december 16th and it is quite possible that more information could come out in between now and the time that this video goes up or shortly after this video comes out and for the sake of this family and for lydia or dia i really hope that we know more soon because as of right now this case is a huge mystery and there's just so many ways that it could have gone that it really leaves your mind wondering. But before I get into the case, I just wanted to remind you guys that between now and the end of the year, which is quickly approaching, I think we have just a few days left of 2022 when this video goes live, which is just insane to me. This year flew by, but there's still time to make your donation to National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and I will match your donation. It is that time of the year where I'm sure many of you are looking to make donations to various charities, and NECMEC is so deserving of your donation. We talk about National Center for Missing and Exploited Children all the time here on my channel. They do such a huge variety of incredible work in the crime space and really focus their attention on children. NECMEC aids in the fight against child sexual exploitation, which is just rampant these days and they need all the support they can get, as well as missing children and children who are victimized. They also do a lot to educate the public on how to be safe. NECMEC provides families with tons of support. They do work on the ground, they create age progressions, and just offer general support to families in need. It's truly a great one to give back to. I know for a fact that your donation will be used in incredible ways and you can really feel good about it. So again, I will be matching all of your donations up to $50,000 and we have a goal of raising 100,000 by the end of the year. We are very close to reaching that goal. So help us get there. The link is below. You have to donate through that specific link so that I'm able to track and match match it. Also, I wanted to let you guys know that this is going to be my last video that I'll be posting this year. However, I'll be back early next year, 2023. Can you believe it? But I am aiming to be back with another video on January 9th. So not too long, but I'm just taking a little break to spend time with my family. All right, let's go ahead and get into this case. So Lydia was born as Lydia Kenshalo on July 6th, 1954 near Mountain Center, California. And she remained in the Southern California area area for her entire life. And like I said, Lydia went by her nickname, Dia most of the time. So going back in time a bit here, she was 25 years old when she met a 39 year old named Clem Abrams, who at that point was already a multi-millionaire. Dia and Clem dated for five years before they became engaged in 1984. And then they went on to have two kids named Clinton and Chris Sara. So like I said, Clem was a very rich man. He was very successful working in real estate and continued to earn their family millions of dollars throughout the years. He and Dia, owned and developed several different properties, which were located on the Bonita Vista Ranch, which spans over 116 acres in Idlewild, California. And the whole ranch, as you can imagine, is worth several million dollars. It is super, super luxe. And this place looks absolutely gorgeous. And their property was massive. And it was truly Dia's dream come true. So as you can imagine, since they had so much land, Dia was a big fan of nature. She loved to do things outdoors. She loved to ride horses. 
horses, hike, and she was also a huge animal lover and loved to rescue animals. So living on the ranch was really a dream life for her. People who were close to Dia say that she was a bit of a spitfire, but at the same time, she was very kind and caring. And although she clearly had a very down to earth side to her being so connected to nature and you know her passion for animals, it was no secret that she definitely liked to keep up with her appearance. And by all means, she definitely had the money to do it. But as we all know, money doesn't always buy happiness. Now their marriage was good for a long time and it started off really strong. And you know, the early years with their kids were really great living on this beautiful ranch, but eventually things started to take a turn for the worse and they ended up getting separated. Now it's kind of confusing what their arrangement was after they were separated. I wasn't able to really figure out exactly what the agreement was during their separation or you know why they kept living on the same property together, but they did. Both of them remained living on the Bonita Vista Ranch and Dia did not give up on love altogether after their marriage failed. She continued to date and she ended up joining FarmersOnly.com and in 2016, she actually met a man named Keith Harper. At this point, she was in her early 60s and Keith was in his late 60s and he said that their relationship just really hit the ground running, that there was immediate attraction and a spark between them and he said that he was looking for her his entire life and he was so happy to have finally found the woman of his dreams. But before I talk about them as a couple, I wanted to quickly talk about Keith Harper as an individual. So Keith was born and raised in Idaho and after graduating from high school in 1967, he went on to attend college at BYU in Utah. He earned an associate's degree, an undergraduate degree, and two master's degrees. Now he also had children with his first wife. He had four kids and then he went on to marry two more times before he actually met Dia. And in addition to his rocky marital history, he also has a rocky criminal history. In 1996, he received his first sexual assault violation, which his second wife made against him. And that assault was actually expunged from his record, but that was just the start of things when it comes to Keith and sexual misconduct. Three other women actually accused Keith of sexual assault during a snowmobiling incident in Colorado. Keith was actually the owner of a business out in Durango, Colorado called Outlaw Rivers and Jeep Tours, which offered various activities activities such as snowmobiling. And in 2011, three women came forward with allegations of unlawful sexual conduct against Keith. And they all claimed that he touched them inappropriately while on the snowmobiles. And he was found guilty of misdemeanor sexual assault in two out of the three claims. And he ended up being sentenced to 30 days in jail, four years of probation. And he also at that point had to register as a sex offender. And on top of all that, it turns out he was also operating this business illegally on an expired license in a national forest. He pled guilty and was sentenced to four months in jail and then had to pay several thousand dollars in fines as well. So getting back to Keith and Dia's relationship, things really hit the ground running when they first met. Like I said, the two of them met on farmersonly.com and you know their relationship began online just by chatting and this was in 2016. And eventually he decided to go ahead and make the trip from Colorado to California to meet her in person. And he was aware at this time that she was technically still married to her ex, Clem, and still lived on the same property as him. But from what I can tell, this really didn't hinder their relationship at all. So at first they would go back and forth between California and Colorado to spend time with each other. Dia went out to Colorado several times to Durango and all of that was pretty short lived because in less than six months, the two of them were already living together at the Bonita Vista Ranch. And for a while, things for Dia were going pretty well. And it wasn't until 2018 that things started to get a little rocky because Clem actually passed away. He had been bad illness for years at this point, so it wasn't a huge shock, but his death quickly sparked a legal battle within the Abrams family that would end up coming under a lot of public scrutiny. You see, before his death, Clem had appointed his two children, Clinton and Chrisara, as the executors of his estate and beneficiaries of his trust, and he basically left them the majority of what was his, which left Dia, on the other hand, with very little. In the end, she was awarded a few properties and a marital 
trust that would provide her with drastically less money than she was used to living off of. And keep in mind, she started dating Clem in her 20s and had access to his multi-million dollar success for nearly 40 years. So this was a huge lifestyle change for her. And the prenup that the two of them signed back in 1984 was another document that stated how little Dia would be left with. To give you kind of the gist of the prenup, it essentially said that Dia's income during marriage would remain her separate property and Clem's income during marriage would remain his separate property. So in the event of a divorce, they would each keep what was theirs and then split any assets that they shared between the two of them 50-50. Now, obviously this type of agreement isn't unheard of or really out of the ordinary or outrageous in any way, but since Dia was encouraged by Clem to not work and he was the one who maintained their finances, she really never had the opportunity to earn anything of her own. He literally told her throughout the years that he would take care of everything, that she didn't even have to think about work or money or get involved in their finances in any way. He was in complete control. But now that he was gone, none of his earnings were technically Dia's property. And this prenup was one out of two legal documents that essentially passed the majority of his wealth onto his kids, leaving Dia in a tough position. So because of all this, she decided to petition the court to invalidate the prenup and modify it the trust because she felt like a lot of what was being left to the kids should have been left to her. Take the ranch, for example. She had lived on it and maintained it for years. And I guess her kids never really came to visit. If you want to read the entire petition for yourself, it is available online, but for the sake of time, I'm going to do my best to summarize what Dia and her lawyers were attempting to do. So first, let's talk about the petition to invalidate the prenup, which was filed in June of 2019, and it included three main arguments as to why the prenup should be invalidated. First, they argue that the prenup was administered involuntarily. Second, they argue that the terms were unconscionable. And third, they argue that the prenup violated public policy. I know that's all really confusing, so let's break it down. Even though Dia signed the prenup back in 1984, she claims it was signed under duress because at the time she was four months pregnant and just weeks away from their wedding and they had already invited guests, booked the venue, it was already paid for and Clem came to her and asked her to sign this prenup and obviously she was in a stressful situation. She didn't want to end up being a single mother and they had all these people coming in for their wedding, so duress. Next, there's the argument that the terms of the prenup were unconscionable. One of the conditions of the prenup stated that Dia would not be granted community property in the event of a divorce. Community property laws state that in the event of a divorce, couples are required to split equally all assets acquired during the marriage, but their prenup states that Dia would not be granted this. And because she was so dependent on Clem, she never acquired her own assets or properties. So she and her lawyers argued that because of this, the terms in the prenup were unfair towards Dia and should be invalidated. And then lastly, we have the argument that the prenup violated public policy. And in this part of the petition, Dia's lawyers reference public policy dating back to 1872 and use it to argue that the prenup was in violation of said policy. And in addition to invalidating the prenup, I also mentioned that Dia was looking to modify Clem's trust. But in all honesty, that is an even longer and more complex complicated series of arguments. Again, all of this is really complicated, but if you want to access the petition online yourself, you are able to do so. But what's really most important to understand here is that Dia was seeking $6.7 million from Clem's estate to fund the marital trust, which would provide her with far more money than she was left with initially. And as you probably already guessed, her kids, Clinton and Chris Sara, were not happy about this because it would leave them with far less than what they were originally supposed to get. So of course, in response, they filed an opposition, which essentially told the court that the original documents should be upheld. As you can imagine, the petition and the opposition sparked a year long conflict between Dia and her kids. And it's just so sad when large amounts of money like this come in between family. And it happens so often. I mean, that's why I think the phrase money doesn't buy you happiness is so true because all that arguing was precious time that ended up being wasted because on June 6th, 2020, Dia vanished 
from the Bonita Vista Ranch. And to this day, she has never been found. So let's talk about this day that Dia went missing. The 6th was a Saturday and it was a very normal day from what I can tell. That day Dia woke up like normal and she ended up baking a batch of fresh cinnamon rolls for a neighbor of hers who was terminally ill. After the cinnamon rolls are done baking, she packs them up and brings them over to this neighbor who confirms seeing her and then goes back home. Then around 2 p.m., her and Keith got together for lunch at the main house on the property. And this is where things between Keith and Dia are a little dicey because by 2020, Keith claims that he and Dia were were engaged to be married. However, this is questionable. And as far as what happened during this lunch, we only have what Keith says to go off of because he was the last person apparently who was with Dia before she vanished. And Keith said for the most part, this lunch was normal, that they were enjoying their time together, but that one thing was kind of out of the ordinary. Dia had brought up to him a matter of concern. And he claims that he told her that they could talk about whatever was on her mind later that evening maybe, or while they were traveling to Colorado the next day. Well, we ended lunch. Um, we were going to Durango, Colorado on the following day. She said, she had made a statement. She said, uh, I would like to talk with you. And I said, well, we have the meadow to do. And I said, I'll be till dark getting the meadow done. And uh, I said, we can we talk once I finish that? So they end up wrapping up their lunch around 2.30. So it was like a 30 minute lunch. And then he went on to mow the meadow and he said he was under the impression that Dia was gonna go tend to their horses at another property on the ranch where they kept the horses. This property, which is located on Toolbox Spring Road is about five miles away from their main residence. And he said he was expecting to see Dia later that evening around dinner time. That was kind of their normal daily routine. But around 7.30, she still wasn't there. And at first he wasn't too worried about it. He said he decided to give her a quick call and see where she was, but then he heard her phone ringing inside the house. So he follows the sound of the phone ringing and it leads him to their bedroom where he finds her phone and also her wallet. Now, it doesn't strike him as that odd right away because she didn't always take her belongings with her everywhere she went. I mean, she was just gonna be on their property. So she really didn't need her phone or her wallet. So he went to go check out back for her truck because like I mentioned this toolbox property was five miles away and so Dia definitely would have taken the truck the truck was her only form of transportation available to her so he checks outside and sees that the truck is still there. And that's when he starts to get concerned. Dia was a very athletic person. She did love to spend time walking on their property. She loved to be out in nature. So it wouldn't be completely unreasonable to think that maybe she went off hiking and just left her belongings behind, maybe to get some space, clear her head. It did seem like she had a lot on her mind during the lunch. But at the same time, Keith was a little concerned with it getting later. And so he wanted to make sure that she wasn't in an accident or anything somewhere on the property, so he made a phone call to a highway patrolman that he knew. And this guy was actually someone that they knew. He used to live on one of their properties on Toolbox Spring Road, so he was familiar with their family and the area. So Keith tells him that he hasn't seen Dia in a few hours, and he wanted to know if any medical reports or incidents in the area had been called in. The patrolman hadn't heard anything, but he told Keith that he would let him know if he did. He did, however, tell Keith that if he did report Dia missing that it would be about three days before the police actually filed a missing persons report. She had a highway patrolman that was living at Toolbox. He had just shortly moved to another location. Anyway, I had talked with him and he said, well, they're not going to do anything for almost three days because of the fact that uh, that's their rule. I'm not, I, I wasn't sure where she was. So I was more concerned about searching the property, making sure that she wasn't trapped in a storage box or some other location. And it takes a while to search that property because there's a lot of structures. Who was that highway patrolman? I can't remember his name. Was that the first person that you called after you had been searching for Dia? Correct. I was just concerned if there had been any medical uh, reports or anything and he indicated that he hadn't heard of anything and uh, 
he also informed me it would be a while before they would actually consider her missing. And with that information, Keith decided to just go to bed that night without Dia, hoping that she would come back the next day and everything would be cleared up. But the next day, Sunday, June 7th, Dia did not come back and... So Keith decided at that point to go ahead and make some calls to friends and some neighbors as well, letting them know that he couldn't find her. Did you make any other phone calls that evening or that night? We started making phone calls to people, not that night, but in the next morning, we started making phone calls to neighbors and people that knew her and started organizing a search of the branch. So the news that Dia was missing traveled fast, and so a group of people, including her son Clinton, gathered at the ranch to search the property. But despite being the person to tell everyone that she was missing, Keith was not helpful at all when it came to looking for her, which is obviously very suspicious and it gets even worse. Both her son Clinton and another man named Isardro Garcia who worked at the property said that Keith was not helpful during their search at all. And not only did he notice that Keith wasn't being helpful, but it didn't seem like he was all that surprised about this considering how Keith had treated him in the first place. You see, Keith was actually a horrible person when it came to their employees. He was known for treating them like slaves. He was also very racist. He never liked Keith and always felt like he was treated like garbage by him. And it was just such a difference from how he was treated by Clem and Dia. He's a, he's a mean guy. He's not a nice person. I'll tell you that. I can't, I don't trust him anymore. I never trust him. He tried to treat you like slave. He told Dia one day I I'm, I'm was his slave. So he wasn't the only one that actually noticed how unhelpful Keith was being that day and how his behavior seemed weird. He felt like Keith was being shifty and very reluctant to speak. What was your impression of Keith Harper on that Sunday when you arrived? He was very shifty, reluctantly speaking kept stating he had meetings and he couldn't be there. But of course, without Keith's help, the search for Dia went on. So a woman named Diana Fetter, who was a friend and neighbor of Dia's, really took the lead on the search. Now, Diana is really an important piece of this story, and I'll come back to more information about her later, but I want to keep talking about this initial search for Dia. Obviously, their property is huge, and so there is so much land to cover when searching for Dia. And not only only are they searching for her, but they're looking for any clues as well. But unfortunately, their search really turned up nothing, and Dia was officially reported as a missing person to the Riverside Sheriff's Department that day. And it wasn't until the following day, Monday, June 8th, that the investigation actually began. And obviously, Keith's behavior up until this point has been extremely weird. And get this, when the official police search actually began that morning, Keith actually packed up his RV and left the state of California. That's right, he packed up all his shit and just left. While the love of his life is missing and all these people are looking for her and now the police are involved, you know, such a crucial time he just decides to leave. And then on Monday morning, Harper left in the RV, right? Yeah, I come in like probably like 8.30 maybe, and he was ready to leave. So soon I get there and he just left. And then he told me, I'll be back later. I gotta go to Arizona for an appointment or something. So obviously Keith is already looking extremely sketchy. And in his deposition, he says he went to Arizona because he had a property there and was having a tax issue he had to deal with. Now, why he couldn't deal with this tax issue at a different time is totally beyond me. Keith said that he originally planned to return to California the next day, but at that point, the police had totally locked down the ranch, so he said he wouldn't have been able to get back in. So the investigative team spent the next three days intensively searching the 116-acre ranch, and during that time, Keith was not there. The Riverside Sheriff's Department brought in a lot of people to 
help search the ranch because it is such a huge property. They brought in several different teams, including the missing persons and homicide teams, as well as a team of divers. And several search warrants were granted, including one for the primary residence, one for the second property on the ranch, and one for Keith's storage facility business in New Mexico, and also one for Keith's RV. And while executing a search on the primary residence, investigators found the following items. A tan bedsheet with possible blood, a band-aid with possible blood, a piece of toilet paper with possible blood, two spent bullet casings, two handwritten letters, and a net gear router. And then there's another wild element to all this because a second search warrant of the property ended up finding what looked to be an illegal marijuana operation. The police ended up seizing more than 2,300 plants and 357 pounds of processed marijuana, which is a lot. And Keith denied even knowing about this, which seems kind of hard to believe. And anyway, all of this ended up having nothing to do with her disappearance, according to police. And so the search continued and two more search warrants were executed later that week. In addition to the properties he owned in Arizona, Keith also owned and operated a storage company called American Storage out of Aztec, New Mexico. And this storage facility business was searched on June 13th, 2020. And unfortunately, this is another other instance where investigators have not revealed if they found anything or if they did what they found. But we do know that the same day that the storage business was searched, investigators also searched Keith's RV. We also know that the RV was seized upon being searched and the front seat was removed and collected as evidence. So we have a handful of search warrants that provided police with some amount of evidence, but we don't really know yet how any of it is connected to Dia's disappearance. And I imagine that this information will be kept private until Dia is found, hopefully, which as of right now has not happened. And I'm sure you're starting to get very, very sketchy vibes about Keith. And you definitely aren't alone in that. Now, during this time that Keith was out of town and the police are searching multiple properties and collecting evidence across two different states, Clinton and Chrysera are back at the ranch. And given the fact that they are her children, the police handed over control of the house to the two of them, which seemed to be a problem for Keith and for Diana. I briefly mentioned Diana earlier and how she kind of took control of the search efforts. Let's talk about her a little bit more. So Diana Fetter is a neighbor and also supposedly a very close friend of Dia. Dia met her back in 2015 and they had been pretty close ever since. But of course, it's more complicated than that. She was actually an employee of Dia's and she managed five different Airbnb rental properties that were on the ranch. And what's really strange about Diana is in the first couple of days that Dia was missing, she was armed and she kind of acted like a guard for the main house. She stood out front of the door and made sure that no one came inside. This obviously could have been to preserve the crime scene for investigators or a potential crime scene, but many people think that it's odd and that maybe she had something to hide and her kids, Dia's kids definitely think that she had something to hide. Both Clinton and Chrysara think that Keith was involved with their mother's disappearance, but that Diana also helped. Now there's one big piece of information when it comes to Keith and Diana that is going to make you think, what the fuck? And it is going to help you understand why Clinton and Chrysara think that they are involved with their mother's disappearance. On May 22nd, 2020, just 15 days before Dia disappears, there was an amendment that she made to her trust and power of attorney. In addition to removing her children entirely from her trust and will, she appointed Keith as the primary trustee and Diana as an alternate. And it literally states, Truster leaves nothing but love and affection to her kids, which I will say is not that surprising considering they were in this huge legal battle over Clem's will. But Dia also amended her power of attorney. For those of you who don't know, a power of attorney letter is a legal document that allows someone to appoint another the ability to manage their finances, property, and things like that in the event that they are unable to. So in this case, Dia stated that if she were unable to manage her own finances and property, Keith and Diana were granted permission to make decisions 
on her behalf. Keith was also added as a beneficiary to her estate in the event of her death. Very strange considering she disappears 15 days later. This is obviously incredibly suspicious. And how many cases have we talked about where things start off with an amended trust or a new life insurance policy and then within a matter of weeks, someone just turns up missing or dead? I'm not saying this is the case here necessarily. Innocent until proven guilty, right? But this is weird. I think we can all agree this is very, very weird. And obviously this means that Keith and Diana stood to benefit from Dia's death or disappearance. But it gets even sketchier because it turns out Keith told a Sergio that he hoped he lived another five years because in five years, Dia would be declared legally dead and he would be awarded her estate. One day he told me, I hope I can live five years. I, I hope I can I live five years. That's what he told me one day. After she went missing? Yeah. He said, he told me, I hope I live five more years. Now, I want to rewind a little bit back to where I said that Clinton and Chris Sarah being handed the keys to her property was a bit of an issue. And well, that's because, like I mentioned earlier, Dia had written them out of control of her estate. And according to Diana, Dia feared that if her children got a hold of it, they would take everything. It has been said by Dia that she does not want the children to have anything to do with any of her properties and that if something happened to her, it was the children because they want, she didn't say want what I have, but they'll come in here and take everything. And so she made me promise, as well as several other people, that the children would not be allowed in the home because the first thing that would happen if she was gone, that they would come in and take everything. So while Keith was out of town dealing with his tax issue in Arizona, Diana took it into her own hands to get the power of attorney letter to show the authorities in order to gain control of the property back. And she was successful. Clinton had to turn the keys back over to Diana, who then passed the keys off to Keith when he returned to California. And once again, she claimed that this was to protect Dia's belongings from her children. And I understand that this is a lot of legal back and forth here. It's probably really confusing, but just hang tight because there's more. On April 20th, 2021, Clinton and Chris Sara filed a petition with the Riverside Probate Court in an attempt to terminate the power of attorney document. They want to be able to make decisions on their mother's behalf rather than leave it in the hands of the people that they feel are responsible for her disappearance. Now, like I did earlier, I'm going to try my best. Keep in mind, I have no legal background, but I'm going to try my best to summarize the main points of this petition. So the petition lays out several points as to why Keith Harbour should not be acting as Dia's power of attorney. And one of the main glaring reasons that they cite is the fact that the power of attorney document itself is incomplete and unsigned. Now, listen to how crazy this is. This document is actually referred to as a partial power of attorney because it lacks all the elements to be considered complete. The document itself is also just weird and looks unofficial. It's written in several different fonts and the text randomly changes sizes. But the biggest and most absurd thing here is in the document's final page. This page, which is supposed to include Dia's signature, was taken and replaced with a page from a completely different document. Page six of power of attorney was replaced with page 16 from the trust. And I'm not talking about lifting her signature and getting it copied onto page six, I'm saying that page six was literally gone and a copy of page 16 from the trust was just put on the end, probably in hopes that no one would notice that it just came from a different document. So based on this, it looks like Dia never signed the power of attorney document and Keith or someone tried to make it look like she did. And the weirdness does not stop there, folks. This petition also states several other reasons as to why Keith should be removed as power of attorney. For starters, a power of attorney document is invalid if the principal, Dia, is deceased. Even though we don't know if she's deceased or not, the fact that it's being treated as a homicide investigation should be enough to make this document invalid. And it also includes the following. Keith has previously and unsuccessfully tried to use the document to file lawsuits on Dia's behalf. And this has the potential to cause irreparable damages. He has a criminal history and has served time in jail. His potential involvement in Dia 
Garcia's disappearance is obviously a conflict of interest, and Keith refuses to hand over a full and complete copy of the power of attorney. He also has potential involvement in the illegal marijuana grow on the ranch. And in the time that he has acted as power of attorney, he has failed to make the mortgage payments on two properties, showing that he's unfit and incapable of handling the fiduciary duties. Clinton and Chris Sarah also allege in their petition that Diana should not be awarded power of attorney because she has been acting shady too. I mean, for one, they believe Diana might be connected to the missing mortgage payments. They also claim that she stole Dia's firearms, which she ended up selling with a few other belongings of Dia's in a garage sale right after she disappeared very weird. She also has refused to account for the money that has been collected from the Airbnb properties on the ranch that she manages. They also stated that they believe that Diana could be a co-conspirator with Keith when it comes to their mother's disappearance or death and they think that she may have been having a relationship with Keith behind their mother's back. And those are just the main reasons that Chris Sarah and Clinton believe that Keith and Diana should not be acting as Dia's power of attorney. And so in response to this, Keith and Diana have obviously had to explain why they were added as power of attorney and trustee in the first place. And that takes us back to Dia's relationship with her kids. So in mid 2020, right around the time that she disappeared, as we know, Dia was working against her kids to make changes to her ex-husband's will. So Diana and Keith say that her making changes to her will wasn't random or for no reason. Keith and Diana claim that Dia was worried that her kids were going to do something bad to her. And so she changed her will to make sure that they weren't in charge of any of her assets in the event that she died. She so redid the power of attorney, she so redid her trust, we put all of her properties into trust. What, what was her purpose for the power of attorney? I mean, what was- She wanted to redo the will because the old will had the kids in it. She wanted to remove her kids. Now, obviously that is just coming from Keith and Diana. So I know I'm kind of jumping around here, but next I wanna talk about a piece of information that came forward during Keith's deposition. Keith claims that about a year after Dia disappeared, he hired an organization to help called Find Me. Find Me is a group that works to help find missing people. And it was founded by a man named Kelly Snyder, who says that his investigation into Dia's disappearance relied heavily on the use of psychics. That's right, people, psychics. Now, psychics and true crime is heavily debated. Most of the time, leads that come from psychics do not pan out and end up being unhelpful or harmful to families' investigations. However, there have been times where psychics have been right on when it comes to information that they tell police about cases. And there are FBI agents and police that use psychics and actually do have certain ones that they find to be reliable and have helped in the past. So, you know, it's totally up to you what you think about the use of psychics. So Keith claims that this organization, Find Me, figured out who killed her, where she was killed, and the GPS location of her body in under five weeks. And I'm sure you're wondering, okay, well, who killed her and where is she? And if this organization claims to have solved the case, why hasn't it been announced that it's been solved? Well, because their only source for this is psychics. So obviously that doesn't hold up. And to add to how weird all of this sounds, and I know it sounds weird, Keith also is having trouble recalling the information that this organization apparently has found. He continuously flip-flops on what information he said he was told from the report. First, he said he was never shown the final report from Find Me. Then he claimed that the information he was told from the report, he had forgot. Yeah, that's right. Forgot who he was told killed the love of his life and where she currently is. Obviously, we don't believe that, right? When he was directly asked who Dia's alleged killer was, Keith said, you'd have to read the report. I don't remember the name. I'm sorry, but what? You were told who the killer was and you somehow just forgot? It seems like information that you just would not forget. Oh, but don't worry. Eventually, it comes back to him. And Keith said he finally remembers who he was told killed Dia. He said that Dia's body was in Hemet Lake, which is on the Bonita Vista Ranch property, which, by the way, had already been searched and cleared. And he said that she was killed by a man named Patrick Griffin. When it was brought up to him that the Hemet Lake had already been searched and cleared, he said that the killer had come back 
after it was searched and moved her body there. This is literally as strange as it sounds. So who is this Patrick Griffin character? Well, Keith said he is someone that was hired by Clinton Dia's son to kill his mother. And he said he was able to confirm this because some of Patrick's belongings were found on a street near the ranch shortly after Dia went missing. So yes, you heard that right. Keith believes that Clinton killed his mother or hired someone to kill his mother for him. And like I said earlier, there is a possibility that Dia was scared of her son, Clinton. It can't be confirmed because, you know, it's mainly coming from Keith and Diana. And I know Keith definitely looks super sketchy in this whole situation, but there are many people that believe that Clinton really could have been involved in his mother's death. Let's talk about that a little more. So Keith has stated that in the months leading up to Dia's disappearance, she was terrified that something was going to happen to her, that her son, Clinton, was going to do something to her. And she allegedly told Keith and six other friends, this is alleged, that if something happened to her, to look into her kids specifically. And her reason for apparently believing this goes back to the original petition. Keith claims that Dia was worried that her kids would retaliate against her for trying to make changes to Clem's will. And that's why, according to Keith, that he and Dia were going back to Colorado in June of 2020. So it was your understanding that this concern about Clinton flowed from some filing that Dia had made in connection with the family trust. Is that right? Correct. Do you know what Dia was seeking to accomplish through that filing? She was filing to challenge the trust that she was entitled to a portion of that trust because she had been married for 35 years to Clem. And she felt that Clinton was so upset about that that he was going to do something violent. Is that what you're saying? Correct. She was fearful that Clinton would be was involved in a situation that would take her life or make her disappear. That's a part of the reason we were going to Colorado to displace her to give her a better living situation where she would not have to worry. Did she tell you what caused her to worry about Clinton? She had told six of her friends that uh, she believed that that Clinton had issued a order for her extermination. And remember earlier how I mentioned Keith and Dia were having lunch the day that she disappeared and that she told him she had a matter of concern to talk to him about. Even though Keith doesn't know for sure exactly what she was going to say, he believes that it was mainly going to be about the concern she had regarding her son, Clinton. Keith believes that Dia was probably trying to warn him about how scared she was of him. Anything unusual come up during that conversation that sticks out in your mind? She indicated that she wanted to talk to me, that she had a matter of concern that she wanted to make me aware of. And I told her that we were leaving for Colorado the next day. And I said, if it can be held till I finish the meadow, because it's going to take me till dark to finish the meadow, that uh, if we could talk or we would have all the next day to talk as we traveled. Did she give you some indication that that matter of concern would have taken longer than 30 minutes to discuss? No, she, she had discussed that she was concerned that she, she was fearful that Clinton would be was involved in a situation that would take her life or make her disappear. God, everything about this case is absolutely crazy to me. But on top of all of this, Keith claims that Clinton had tried to kill his mother in the past. He claims that years ago, Dia had this surgery and she came home to recover and Clinton came to visit and Keith claims that Clinton tried to poison his mother, but his attempt failed and she ended up in a three-day coma instead. She, uh, when, when she was recovering, the only person in the room was Clinton and she believed that she was slept a drug by Clinton that was intended to take her life. But the strange thing is Dia never reported this to the police. It's all very weird, like everything else in this case. So even though there's many reasons to believe that Keith could be behind all of this, there are reasons to believe that maybe Clinton really was behind his mother's disappearance. And many people are on his side. I mean, both Clinton and Keith would have reasons to kill Dia. I mean, they both would benefit from her death. So at this point, they're both pointing their fingers at each other. and. 
each one of them believes they have enough evidence behind their theory that the other killed Dia. And this confusing spiral of information just keeps on going. The relationship between Clinton and Dia has been highly debated, highly scrutinized in the years since she disappeared. Obviously it's hard to know, but from what I can tell, it doesn't seem that Clinton and Dia were particularly close in the years leading up to her disappearance. And Isardro says that Clinton only came to visit a handful of times. And he also says that Chris Sarah never really came by at all. Well, when's the last time Clint before she went missing, when was the last time Clinton was up at the ranch? Probably was probably a year, maybe. A year. I, I can't remember. Long time, right? Yeah, a long time ago. After Clem died, it seems that whatever relationship the two of them did have became very strained and distant. And obviously the petition she was filing against her kids didn't help with that at all. But Clinton has heavily denied the fact that he and his mother were not close. He says that the two of them were in constant communication and loved one another dearly. And he says that everything that the media has spun up about the relationship between him and his mother is just false and was a tactic to make people more suspicious about him. Would you describe yourself as estranged from your mom? I wouldn't, no, not at all. Actually, we spoke pretty regularly and we loved each other very dearly. Our love was so deep and so true that it didn't even need to be spoken, although we said, I love you nonstop. So I would not describe myself as estranged, except maybe the past couple months after my father passed away. But even during any sort of what may appear like tension, my mother always called me and always said, I love you so much, Clinton. No, nothing is personal ever. It's, it's from the heart, I truly, you know, I, I love you. You know. The whole interview with Clinton is very interesting to say the least. And I definitely encourage you guys to go check out the entire thing for yourself. Kind of see what you think after listening to him explain things, you know, in his own words and also pay close attention to his body language. This interview was done one year after Dia disappeared. And it was actually the first time since she went missing that Clinton actually talked to the media. And he explains that it was all under the advice of his lawyers that he didn't speak sooner. But once he was ready to talk, he had a lot to say. At the time of this interview, he believed that his mother had been murdered and that not enough was being done to figure out who did it and where she was. Uh, what do you think happened to your mom? I believe she was murdered and uh, we need to find her um, for her soul to rest in peace and for the community to heal. Um, I don't believe she's still alive, personally. My mother was a, was a lively, vivacious, gregarious individual and she would not be able to just intentionally disappear and go somewhere. So I believe she's deceased and something needs to be done to, to find her. Thus far, we haven't. And the individuals I believe to be responsible have not even been brought in for questioning. And it's clearly no secret that Clinton does not believe that Keith and his mother had the relationship that he claimed. In fact, it seems that he doubts that they even had a relationship at all. Clinton says that he never even met Keith. In fact, he never heard his name until after his mother disappeared. Uh, what can you tell me about Keith Harper uh, being her fiance? It's definitely not the case. I know my mother, she was not gonna remarry. Keith Harper was not her fiance? I don't believe that to be the case. Do you believe he was her boyfriend? I do not believe that to be the case either. I believe at one time they were potentially close. I can't say for sure, I do not know. However, I do not believe at the time she had disappeared that they were had that type of relationship. Meanwhile, Keith claims that Clinton knew exactly who he was and that he's lying about not knowing him. And if all of this wasn't confusing enough and good for you if you've hung in till this point, remember the truck that I talked about at the beginning, the truck that Dia used to get around her property? Well, that truck used to belong to Clem and when he died, it became the legal property of Clinton. And so there's all these reports out there that claim that Dia and Clinton were fighting over this truck towards the end and she wouldn't hand the truck over to him. And I bring this up because in the days after her disappearance, when Clinton had control of the property, he got a hold of the truck's keys and claims to have found a bloody pillow inside of it. Now, this little bit of information is so frustrating and 
is driving me insane because there is no credible mention of this anywhere other than Clinton's interview. All of what is the deal with this truck? Why is it necessary for you to go up there and seize the truck? The truck's not necessary. All that was white noise created by attorneys. We got the truck after the fact in case there was evidence in it, in case it would lead to finding Dia. That was solely our concern and making sure it wasn't in the possession of anybody with malintent. Okay, you wanna talk about what you found in the truck? Uh, I, found, I found blood in the truck, I found a bloody pillow. I called homicide. They came and got the truck and did an extensive investigation on it. There are a few sites online that claim that the police did find this bloody pillow and that they have it in their possession. However, all of these sites are not very credible. So this bit of information, I just can't confirm to be true or not. I'm leaning towards it being true because I don't know why Clinton would talk about it so publicly unless it was true, but I don't know. Okay, so all of that was a lot. And if you're confused, you are not the only one. I am still confused myself. I wanted to, you know, report on everything that I found, but a lot of it was hearsay as well. So I wanted to try to stick to the facts as much as possible. I hope you guys were able to follow along because I know the back and forth nature of this case is a bit exhausting, but it is so important to talk about. And Dia is still missing to this day. It's been two and a half years at this point. Dia was 65 years old at the time of her disappearance and was last seen wearing a black and turquoise jacket, a yellow shirt, and blue jeans. She is approximately five foot five and has blonde hair and blue eyes. So if you have any information regarding her disappearance, please contact the Riverside County Sheriff's Department at 951-776-1099. You can also reach out to investigators at 760-578-2101 or 951-203-3767. I really wish we had more information because this case is so frustrating and I honestly don't know what to think. I think Keith is super, super sketchy, but there's a possibility that Clinton is as well and not knowing how Dia herself was really feeling towards the end of her life keeps this mystery even more of a mystery. It's possible that Keith and possibly Diana as well, had something to do with Dia's disappearance, but it's also possible that Clinton and maybe someone else that he hired also have something to do with her disappearance. Or it's possible that neither of them do, and there's a third party that we don't know about at this point. I mean, this one is truly, truly frustrating, and I really want to know what you think. So leave me a comment, let me know your thoughts, and hopefully I'll be able to make an update on this case at some point if more information does come out. But before I wrap up today, I need to thank today's sponsor, Rocket Money. As you guys know, I recently had a baby, and so life has become more complicated than ever, and money management has become even more important to me. The mission at Rocket Money is to meaningly improve the financial health of millions of people. They empower their members to achieve their financial goals by canceling unwanted subscriptions, lowering bills, setting up budgets, monitoring credit, and providing a holistic view of their finances all in one place. I actually do use the Rocket Money app. This is all of the subscriptions that I have going on in my house. You can see HelloFresh, HBO Max, Netflix, etc. With Rocket Money, I've actually been able to lower our bills because Rocket Money negotiates your bill prices for you. All you have to do is upload a photo, tap a button, and Rocket Money can negotiate your bills for you from internet service bills to cable and phone bills. It's also been a super easy way for our family to manage our budget. It automatically monitors your spending by category, and you can get friendly notifications when you've exceeded them and visualize your spend to earn ratio every month, every quarter, or every year. Also, it monitors your credit score, which is very important to me, especially this last year because I bought a new house. And what's so cool is you can try it out for free. And if you want to, you can unlock more features with a premium account. To get started, just head to rocketmoney.com slash Kendall, or you can just click the link in my video description. Thanks so much to Rocket Money for sponsoring today's video. And that's going to be it for me today, guys. I will be back next week or wait. No, I won't. I spoke too soon. I will be back January 9th with another case for us to go through. But until then, over this break, please stay safe out there. Mm -hmm.